Uh, I want to thank Dignity Health for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, I am Dr. Woods. I've been here for 26 years. And in that 26 years, I've seen an awful lot of athletes and knee injuries. So I am part of uh, Central Coast Orthopedic Medical Group. We're a group of nine doctors. We have three offices, one in San Luis Obispo, one in Pismo Beach, and one down in Santa Maria. One of the things I like about being part of a group like that is that I get to collaborate with other doctors on difficult cases. In fact, I called one of my colleagues yesterday about a case that I have. Well, my talk today is going to be on knee pain in the runner, or more, really more appropriately, knee pain in the running athlete. Uh, in our time together, I want to talk a little bit about what a knee injury is in running, a running injury. I want to go uh, over the incidents, how often these things occur. I want to talk to you a little bit about the biomechanics of knee injuries in running, uh, and then really spend most of our time talking about specific injuries and what those are and, and exactly how to treat them. We'll go over treatment and we'll talk about prevention. So what is a running injury? We really talk about two categories of injuries. We talk about intrinsic injuries versus extrinsic. Now an extrinsic injury is an injury that occurs when an, a, a force is applied to the body from external. This is really common in contact sports like football, as you see on the screen here. This, uh, this tackle is about to take that running back out with an external force that may result in an injury. We also see these in basketball uh, and boxing. In contrast, an intrinsic injury is an injury that is inherent in factors in the body. In other words, uh, it's an interaction of really three things. Uh, interaction of the, the athlete's genetic build. This may be their alignment, foot alignment, knee alignment. Uh, their training environment, the shoes they're wearing, the services they're running on, and then finding the training methods, which would be the frequency, duration, and maybe the intensity of their running activities. So what about the incidence of running injuries? Well, just how, how common uh, are these injuries? So how many runners do I have in the audience that run on a regular basis? Now, how many of those same runners run at least 25 miles a week? Any show of hands? One. Good. Well, by definition, a serious runner is anyone that runs 25 miles per week or more. And in serious runners, the injury rate is 30% per year. And what that means is that if you're running, 30% of you will have an injury in any one given year. And most of these do occur in the lower extremity. And by far, the vast majority of these are in the knee itself. So what about the causes of running injuries? Uh, training errors uh, in a couple of studies, uh, two different studies, training errors in one was responsible for two-thirds of the injuries that we see uh, in runners. Uh, and one-third of those involved the knee. In another study, they were looking at all the factors that cause running injuries, and 72% of these were due to training er errors. So, you know, the most common training errors are really uh, sudden changes in either the frequency of training, somebody's getting ready for a race and they really ramp up their speed or their, their distance, uh, changes in the duration of the training, and finally, changes in the intensity of the training, maybe going from flats to hills. Uh, Dr. Ledbetter was an orthopedic surgeon who's written some articles on running injuries, and he came up with this rule of twos. That's not T-W-O, but T-O-O. Athletes court disaster when they train too often, too hard, and after their rehabilitation, or actually in their rehabilitation, they do too little and too late. And finally, after a return to injury, or to running rather, they go back too soon and really with too much intensity, too hard. So it's really beyond the scope of this short talk to talk much about the biomechanics of running injuries, but I, I do want to illustrate just some of the forces that we see by really looking at the patellofemoral joint. Now, the, the patella is another word uh, for kneecap, and the patellofemoral joint then is where the kneecap slides in the end of the, the, the femur, what we call the trochlear groove. Now, straight ahead walking on flat surfaces puts three and a half times body weight of stress across that joint in, in, you know, uh, in pounds per square inch. 
So just straight ahead walking, a lot of stress on a knee. Now you, you go to straight ahead running on level ground and that, that force increases to 7 to 11 times body weight. Add hills, it goes up even higher. So a lot of stresses across our bodies as we are running. Now let's talk about some specific injury patterns. Uh, back in the 70s when uh, running was really gaining its popularity, there was a term in the literature and uh, in the community called runner's knee. Now initially orthopedic surgeons thought that this was just due to you know, wear to the backside of the kneecap, but we've discovered that it's actually uh, a number of conditions that can cause this. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about this runner's knee, which is really anterior knee pain. Anterior means front. So we're talking about pain to the front of the knee. Uh, other four other conditions that can cause it are excessive lateral uh, pressure syndrome, instability to the kneecap, <coughs> tendinopathies to the quadriceps and uh, patellar tendon, and finally uh, a pathologic synovial plica. And I'll explain what those are. So before I get started, I just want to talk a little bit about this diagram. You're going to see this in a few of the slides here. So this picture here is a front view of a knee, uh, showing the kneecap here. Here are the quad muscles. This over here on the left side of that diagram is the lateral side of the knee. And when lateral, we talk about the side of the knee, the outside of the knee being the lateral. Inside of the knee is, is the medial. And uh, what we're talking about with excessive lateral pressure is the ligaments over here that support the kneecap are excessively tight on the lateral side. And that tightness can cause some wear to the cartilage in a knee. This next picture, it's a little difficult to see uh, on the screen here, but uh, this is, these are two pictures I took at surgery in the last six months. This is really a normal kneecap. It's a little tough to see, but it's very smooth. I like to think of, you know, I, I tell patients that their knees and a normal knee, the, the cartilage is as smooth as a baby's bottom. It's very smooth. Now contrast that with this picture. This is another uh, scope, a picture of a knee looking through the, the joint. And this is where this nice smooth cartilage should be. We see a lot of fraying here. Down here you see some flaps of cartilage. But most important, this pink sort of tissue here is actually exposed bone. So this is what we see in severe cases of lateral, excessive lateral pressure syndrome. Now, the second condition that can cause this anterior or front knee pain is patellar instability. That is the kneecap not being stable in that trochlear groove. And very subtle maltracking can cause pain in runners. Uh, and the treatment for this is quadricep strengthening uh, using closed chain exercises. And I'll explain what those are in the next slide. Uh, we really try and rehab uh, patients significantly before we even consider uh, the last resort, which is surgery. So here's an example of a closed chain quad exercise. Here the athlete has got his left foot fixed on the floor. He's doing uh, a lunge with weights in his hands. So the foot in closed chain exercises, uh, or the distal part, the lower part of the extremity is fixed. It's stuck to the floor. And all the movement is from the upper part of the extremity. That's what a closed chain is. Now contrast that, an open chain exercise would be uh, someone sitting on a, a leg extension bench, hip fixed and using a weight, extending it you know, so that the ankle is actually moving. We find that closed chain exercise activity more closely mimics uh, running and sports activities. Now the, the, the third thing that can cause this anterior pain in the knee is patellar tendinopathy. Uh, now this is something I see very uh, frequently in my office, more from basketball players honestly than from uh, distance runners. But what we're talking about, here's the kneecap, the patella. This tendon right here attaches the kneecap and all these powerful quad muscles to the lower part of the leg, the tibia. And right here where the kneecap attaches to the uh, patellar tendon, we start seeing with chronic overuse uh, some degeneration of that tendon. We actually see little microscopic tears of the tendon. And what that results in is uh, some changes in the microscopic nature of that tendon. We see increased cells. We see increased blood vessels. We also see the, the deposition of uh, calcium and fat. Now, 
Another uh, tendinopathy is the opposite side of the kneecap, up here where the quads insert into the top of the kneecap. And uh, this pain is more to the outside. Once again, this is lateral or the outside of the knee. So we're talking about a pain that is on the outside of the kneecap there. Uh, frequently, these can occur with crunching noises. Uh, there's increased pain with squatting activities. And uh, fortunately, this is not very common in runners. And it's less common than the patellar tendinopathy that we, we call jumper's knee. Now, what about the treatment for uh, tendinopathies? Uh, we found that eccentric rehab programs are uh, very effective in helping with tendinopathies. Unfortunately, the, the jumper's knee or the patellar tendinopathy treatment is really only successful uh, conservatively in about 30% of cases. But what, what is an eccentric rehab exercise? Well, picture a bicep curl. Now, the, the concentric part of the exercise is the bringing the, bar, the dumbbell up. The eccentric is by tightening that muscle and slowly lowering, you're doing an eccentric exercise. Now, for a, the quads, it might be, say, picture me on a ramp, toes face downhill. This, you know, lowering yourself into a, a squat is the eccentric portion of that exercise. And that's what's effective in taking care of these. Now, finally, the fourth condition that you can cause this pain to the front of the knee is what's called the pathologic synovial plica. Now, uh, on the picture here, you see they're showing a plica on the inner. This is the medial aspect or the inner aspect of the knee, right over in this area here. And what we see at, at surgery is just a very thin, almost razor-like band of tissue in a normal plica. And I see these in probably 50% of the patients that I take to surgery for some other condition. But with excessive running and excessive force, that little thin band of tissue can become very fibrotic. It can rub across the end of the, the femur right in here and cause pain. Now, this pain typically comes on gradually with running activities. Now, it's, unfortunately, this is hard to see again on the screen, but uh, this is a, a picture I took just two days ago in, in the operating room. This is a patient uh, who is, uh, was a very active triathlete and uh, a very active basketball player. So normally this, this frayed tissue here should be a nice thin knife-like band that unfortunately with this picture you can't see but comes right out to the edge of the, the wall here. And that's once again over on the inner aspect. So pathologic plica typically can be treated conservatively, but when that fails, surgically what I did on this patient is just go in and trim out this band of tissue, this fibrous tissue, and that takes care of that pain. Now let's talk about other conditions. So we've talked about the ones that can cause pain to the front of the knee or anterior pain, but uh, the next few slides I'm going to talk about meniscal tears, uh, bursitis, stress fractures, uh, osteoarthritis, which is uh, wear and tear arthritis. We'll talk about a very, very common one, iliotibial band friction syndrome, and finally we'll talk about popliteal ten tenosynovitis. Now, first of all, let me just describe what a meniscus is. In our knees, between the thigh bone and the tibia, we have two C-shaped washer cartilages. These help distribute the load, they help actually uh, stabilize the knee, and they also work to uh, serve as baffles. Uh, like in an engine, helping to take that lubricating fluid and put it around the knee. <clears throat> now, meniscal tears in young runners are very, very uncommon. But, you know, they're a more common problem with middle-aged and older runners. And these are <clears throat> injuries that can cause swelling, that can cause snapping uh, to the knee. Uh, on this picture here, uh, this is an intraoperative picture again of a normal meniscus and it's a little hard to see, but right down here at the bottom edge, you can see a nice thin edge of tissue. On this picture over here, this is one that's torn. And Sorry about the quality here on the screen, but there's a big piece of the meniscal tissue that came off the back of the knee here. It's all scarred up and is actually stuck between the joint there. So the second condition that we see is bursitis. Now, bursitis is the most common condition that causes pain on the inner aspect, or what we call the medial aspect of the knee. So what's a bursa? It's a little tiny sac that's between our tendons and, and ligaments, uh, uh, between the tendons and ligaments and bone. And what it does is actually serve uh, to be a little lubricating pad, so it allows those ligaments and, and tendons to slide over the bone without causing pain. 
But with running activities, those can become inflamed. Now this, fortunately, is a very easy thing to treat. It's one of the few conditions in runners that we actually use cortisone for. Uh, this diagram shows two bursa. There's one right under the, the hinge or the medial collateral ligament here called Voschel's bursa. And the more common one is right down here where the, the hamstring tendons come from the back of the knee, cross over the, the tibia here, and insert onto the tibia. And this is called the pezanserine bursa. Fortunately, these aren't that common uh, in runners. Now, stress fractures is another place, another uh, thing that can happen with running activities. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often at the knee. More common in the middle of the tibia or the lower part of the tibia, and it's really just from excess activity over too short a period of time. And finally, you know, with the significant increase in the number of older athletes that are running these days, we're, we're starting to see uh, patients that are having knee pain secondary to osteoarthritis. Now, one of the frequent questions I get is, does running cause arthritis? And the answer, fortunately, is no, it does not. If you have normal alignment, uh, then running activities are not, in, in any literature that we've come across, not going to cause osteoarthritis. Now, this picture is a little difficult to see. This is the groove of a, a patient I took care of a couple of days ago. This is the same uh, triathlete that I talked about, the, the basketball player. Uh, now, this normally should be nice, smooth, white cartilage, but what you see here is some of this pink is bone starting to show through. It doesn't show up well here, but there was a flap of uh, cartilage right here. This is the groove where the kneecap rides. In fact, up, up in this area, uh, on my screen at least, you can see the, uh, the kneecap poking out there. Now we get to the iliotibial band friction syndrome. Um, this is a very, very common uh, problem. It's one of the most common problems to the lateral or outer aspect of the knee. And the iliotibial band is a band of tissue that starts with muscle right off the pelvic brim. Just prior to getting to the hip, it turns into a tendon. It's a big, broad band that comes down and crosses the knee. This is a side view of the knee showing that iliotibial band that crosses the knee right in here and inserts down on the tibia. Uh, what can happen with uh, particularly extra long runs and downhill running is that uh, patients can get irritation of this band as it rubs across the femoral condyle here. Usually the pain comes on in a mile or two. Uh, treatment for this condition uh, is stretching working on stretching this band, strengthening the hip abductor muscles, the muscles that bring the hip out away from the body, and occasionally a cortisone injection in that area. Uh, in my 26 years of practice, I've had to only operate on one patient uh, with this condition, and that operation essentially consists of taking out just a little bit of the band here so that it stops flipping over that, that bone. And finally, the last condition I want to talk about is popliteal tenosynovitis. The popliteus tendon is a tendon that comes out of the back of the knee on the outside or lateral side of the knee. It's attached to a muscle here that helps start knee extension. I'm sorry, starts knee flexion. It's the other direction. And that can become inflamed. Uh, treatment there again is stretching, strengthening, just like the IT band, and then a cortisone injection. Now let's move on to talking about treatment uh, of these running injuries. What we're really trying to do is reduce the biomechanical stresses and, and load uh, on the joint. So we want to talk about uh, movement, you know, changing the running style. We talk about the surface, you know, getting patients, uh, runners to run on softer surfaces, a little less stress. We want to look at shoes and, and make sure that they're wearing the appropriate shoes. And finally, we want to talk about just the frequency of their training, really trying to, to change that uh, back off some. I, I hate to tell any patient they can't run, but I try and modify their running activities. Now, the treatment considerations we're going to talk about in the next couple of minutes are looking at the training program, some of the anatomic and biomechanical variations. We're going to look at shoe modifications. Uh, muscle reconditioning and flexibility. We're uh, not going to spend a lot of time talking about orthotics, but that's another way that we can treat these. And uh, then medications, physical therapy, and rarely surgery. First of all, let's talk about the training program. As I mentioned, I don't like to tell a runner that they have to rest. Nobody wants to hear that, but I will get them to try and decrease their running. Change the frequency, maybe the intensity, the duration. Uh, we might try some cross-training, such as aqua jogging. Uh, 
which will help keep the uh, respiratory system going, help keep you know, muscle strength, but decrease some of the load. Then we want to talk about anatomic uh, biomechanical variations. Whenever I'm seeing a patient in the office with a knee in, uh, problem, a runner with knee pain, the first place I look is not the knee, but the hip, then onto the foot, and then finally the knee. Because you have to really look at the whole lower extremity to make sure that there isn't some sort of an anatomic change that's resulting in this knee pain. We want to look at shoe modifications. Um, <clears throat> It's real helpful for me when I see a runner in the office to have them actually bring a pair of shoes in that they've been running in for a while. Because I can look, by looking at the shoe, looking at the wear patterns, looking at the heel counter and how it's breaking down, I can get a, a good idea as to what's causing that problem. We talk about shoes as having you know, three different types of uh, classifications. Uh, the motion control shoe is really a, a shoe for those patients that have a tendency to have subtalar joint uh, abnormalities, and we want to try and prevent the overpronation that that can cause. Uh, a support shoe is really a shoe for just a normal runner that doesn't have any mechanical problems, don't have a high arch. And then finally, the cushion shoe, when we see patients with a uh, very inflexible arch, uh, and we want to get them in a shoe that actually gives them a little bit more cushion and allows a little bit more motion to that foot. And then we want to focus on muscle rehabilitation or reconditioning and flexibility. We want to restore strength and balance uh, to that muscle uh, through uh, therapy. And then finally, want to work on uh, stretching, really gentle, sustained stretching. Uh, this couple is, uh, are both working on their hamstrings. The hamstrings and the gastrocs are the muscles that we tend to get into trouble with with running activities if they're tight. In summary, if you are a serious runner like this gentleman here, over 25 miles uh, per week, your chances of getting a running injury are about 30% on any given year. And once again, most of those injuries are due to really training errors, two-thirds of them training errors. So really prevention is really talking about making sure that you're not over-stressing your body. So once again, Ledbetter's rule of twos. Remember that athletes court disaster when they train too hard, train too much. Once they're uh, in rehabilitation, doing too little of it and too late. And finally, returning back to activity, really doing too much and too hard. So this slide just to remind me to tell you that uh, studies have shown that as we start into a running program, you want to try and limit your mileage increases to no more than 10% per week. And so if, a, if you're, say you've got a, a marathon you're training for, you really want to start by just slowly increasing that mileage. And that'll allow your bodies to, to adapt to that extra mechanical stress that uh, you're putting your body through. So any, any questions that you might have? Thank you for your attention. What this woman is asking is her daughter during uh, high school had a lot of pain down the lower lateral aspect of her calf and then subsequently developed knee pain. Is that correct? Well, uh, there are a lot of things that can cause pain you know, in the lower calf. It could be a stress fracture. It could be, uh, we call, we use the word shin splints, but that, that can be a number of things. It can be a, uh, a subtle chronic compartment syndrome where pressure builds up into the calf muscle with running activities. Uh, it could be a malalignment. So my guess is that she may have had a malalignment. It could have been shoe wear. She could have been wearing the wrong shoes. Any other questions? Okay, so the gentleman is saying that a number of years ago you had an ACL reconstruction and you're back doing some hills and starting to have some pain now in your knees. So the question is, uh, with this increased knee pain on particularly going down hills, what can you do to help mitigate that? Well, it, the stresses on the knee going downhill are probably the most significant. You know, a lot of these conditions I talked about actually are caused more by downhill running, iliotibial band friction syndrome and some of the other uh, conditions. So <clears throat> uh, it, it, it's difficult to say. It, it may be that you have some arthritis in your knee from that injury. Uh, we know that uh, ACL uh, tears can cause subtle arthritis. It could be that uh, you just need to work more on... Uh, the quads or hamstring muscles, flexibility. Uh, it'd be difficult to tell without actually looking at your knee. Yes, ma'am. 
Best surface to run on? Uh, well, a softer surface is ideal, but I mean, it's kind of hard to find them. I mean, tracks, you know, track dirt, uh, firm pack grass. I mean, we don't like patients running on uh, hard pack sand, typically because most beaches have a little bit of a cant to it. If you can find hard pack sand that's very level, that, that would be a good surface. Yes, ma'am. The, the question is, other than Advil, what would I recommend for knee pain? Well, essentially, uh, as far as medications go, uh, you know, a lot of there's been a lot of talk in the literature about uh, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. You know, studies have shown they've actually done a, a study of studies called a meta-analysis, and 50% of patients do get better with glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate as long as you take it on a regular basis. So that's one option. Uh, in terms of what you can take personally, either Advil or Aleve. I like Aleve because it's just twice a day. And then Tylenol can certainly help with the pain. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention and for coming out. And thank you again to Dignity Health for sponsoring this.